In this video, I'm going to discuss how the urine osmolarity will change along the renal tubules and then after that discuss the difference between the nephrogenic as well as the central diabetes insipidus. So here we have the afferent renal arterial which goes inside the glomerulus and then the efferent goes out. And from here on, filtrate will enter the proximal convoluted tubule. And then here we have the loop of Henle, which divides into the descending limb and the ascending limb. Then here we have the distal convoluted tubule. And then finally we have the collecting duct. Now there are a few points that I would like you to know regarding the proximal convoluted tubule. And it's that more than 60% of water reabsorption along the renal tubules is occurring in the proximal convoluted tubule. So even if you combine the water reabsorption from all other segments, they wouldn't be even close to what is being absorbed in the proximal convoluted tubule. So if you're asked, for instance, that there is a drug that stimulates water reabsorption from, let's say, for instance, the descending limb of the loop of Henle, then uh, which of these parts uh, would absorb water the most, the answer would still be the proximal convoluted tubule. The other point that I would like to mention is that as salt is being reabsorbed and water follows, the osmolarity will remain the same because both salt and water has been reabsorbed at the same level. So therefore, the filtrate or the urine remains isotonic. But then, because there is less water in the urine, but the number of molecules of the inulin, paraaminohyporic acid, or for instance creatine has not changed, so we have the same number of molecules of these agents, but then there is less water, therefore the concentration of PAH, inulin, as well as creatine increases along the proximal convoluted tubule. So just keep that in mind. Osmolarity remains the same, but since there is less molecules of water compared to molecules of uh, PAH, inulin, or creatine, therefore the concentration of these agents increase. So again, why is it that if water is being reabsorbed that, that osmolarity remains the same along the proximal convoluted tubule? And the answer is that there is an equal absorption of the salt and water. So the uh, urine in the proximal convoluted tubule remains isotonic. And then from there on, urine enters the descending limb of the loop of Henle, and descending limb is only permeable to water. So therefore now the filtrate or urine becomes hypertonic. And then from here on, the urine will enter the ascending limb of the loop of Henle. And now here, the ascending limb is only permeable to salt. So since salt is being reabsorbed, therefore now there would be hypotonic or decreased osmolarity of the urine. So the urine that reaches the distal convoluted tubule has now the lowest osmolarity. And then finally, the urine will go into the collecting duct and depending on the level of ADH, it's determined how much water is being reabsorbed. And so therefore, the concentration of urine can now be determined by the collecting duct. And so here I have another image that shows you the urine osmolarity along different segments of the renal tubules. So in the proximal convoluted tubule, it stays isotonic. And so 300 remains constant until the urine will reach the descending limb of the loop of Henle. And since in this section only water is being reabsorbed, therefore the osmolarity now increases and becomes hyper tonic. And then finally, it reaches the ascending limb of the loop of Henle where salt is being reabsorbed. So now osmolarity will decrease and by the time it reaches the distal convoluted tubule, it has the lowest osmolarity. And so via this system, now there is a gradient that has been formed. So here in the lower portion of the medullary part of the nephron, there is a high osmolarity of 1200. And then there is also urea reabsorption in the collecting duct which will help maintain this um, high osmolarity and then as we go higher then there would be lower osmolarity so the whole purpose of providing this gradient is now that the collecting duct 
would be able to reabsorb water based on the gradient. So the collecting duct is permeable to water and water can get reabsorbed. And so as the urine goes along, more water will be reabsorbed. But then the rate of the water reabsorption is dependent on the antidiuretic hormone, the other name for which is vasopressin. And so as you increase the concentration of ADH, which is being secreted by the posterior pituitary gland, there would be increased permeability of the collecting duct and so more water will be reabsorbed. So therefore, osmolarity of the urine increases as you increase the ADH concentration. On the other hand, if you have lower ADH concentration, then there would be decreased permeability of the collecting duct and thus urine would be less hypertonic. And so if there is a lack of the function of the antidiuretic hormone, then that would be referred to as diabetes insipidus. And diabetes insipidus is divided into two types, central diabetes insipidus versus nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. So with the central diabetes insipidus, there is problem with the production of ADH or vasopressin from the posterior pituitary gland. So therefore, there is low production of antidiuretic hormone. So the kidneys are functioning properly and will respond well to ADH, but there is no ADH in the body of these patients. And so if you administer ADH to patients that have central diabetes insipidus, it will correct for the urine osmolarity. So the urine can now become more hypertonic versus before the injection, the urine was hypotonic. And then with the nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, there is normal production of ADH, but then the problem is that the collecting duct is now not responding to ADH. So even if you administer ADH, in patients that have nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, it would not correct for the osmolarity of the urine. So nephrogenic diabetes insipidus is because the collecting duct does not respond to ADH, while the central diabetes insipidus is because of the low production of the ADH. And so if you administer ADH in patients with central diabetes insipidus, it will correct for the osmolarity of the urine. Now, one last question I would like to ask you is that, tell me two drugs that are causing nephrogenic diabetes insipidus? And the answer is lithium, which is used to prevent the relapse in patients that have the bipolar disease, as well as demeclocycline, which is an antibiotic that has an antidiuretic hormone antagonist activities. So either lithium administration or demeclocycline can cause nephrogenic diabetes insipidus by interfering with the function of the ADH at the level of the collecting duct. And that concludes our discussion.